Our story is about a boy who heard the same words from an early age. Dedicate yourself to defending your family's honor. His father always insisted that the boy had no aspirations other than to shadow his older brother. Dad also said you should always stay behind and out of the way. If your brother is in danger, you must cover him with yourself. After another fight, the protagonist fell to his knees from exhaustion. The metal armor of the knights rang out, and someone said, Make way and make way! The boy came closer and asked who dared to make such a spectacle here. The protagonist was breathing heavily with his hands on the ground, several rivulets of fresh blood running down his face. A guy standing nearby hid his sword in its scabbard and loudly began to speak. A knight who single-handedly holds back the strongest warriors of the continent has come to us. Meanwhile, some of the army had already fallen in defense of their holy land. Some of them were screaming their death cries, drowning in their own blood. The guy confidently approached the protagonist and, stopping at a distance of several meters, introduced himself as Boris. The protagonist looked at the knight angrily and introduced himself as Lord Kian Vert. Then Boris began to speak superiorly, so you really are his younger brother. I wondered who was making such a mess around here. The answer came to me. Kian, the yard dog, thought he could lead an army, but something went wrong. Hearing such an insult, Lord Kian immediately took his blade out of its sheath and asked who hired you. Kian's entire body began to emit black matter. The blade filled with mana and glowed. At that moment, the hero continued to speak. Did the Emperor himself send you here? Boris raised his hand to shield his eyes from the bright light. He started to say in surprise that it was a black veil, so the rumors were true. You are a murderer from the ranks of the darkness and also an insidious criminal. Meanwhile, Lord Kianworth had risen to his feet. His eyes glowed sharply and the energy emanating from his body frightened the knights who were watching the scene. Then Boris clenched his teeth and went on to say your organization is an eyesore. I'll have to ask for a raise for suppressing a heretic rebel. Lord Kean didn't take long to answer, but go ahead if you can talk by then. Last warning, back off or you'll lose your teeth. But Boris was not afraid, and taking a fighting stance began to say surrender now you are in my power. You can't break through my nine-star barrier. The hero realized a fight was imminent and thought to notify his brother. We need to find out who's behind this. After that, Kian immediately adopted a fighting stance and putting his blade in front of him loudly said ten barriers. I'll wipe it all out and destroy you. Suddenly there was a loud voice, quite Kian move aside, you have already accomplished your mission. Then Boris immediately bowed to the incoming guy. But Lord Kian continued to stand in a fighting stance, thinking about what his father often said to dedicate yourself to defending the honor of the family. You must always stay behind and out of the way. Your brother is our pride. Ashel's success is also your success. The hero couldn't understand what was going on and tried to put everything in his head. He thought about why Boris had decided to fight me, and now my brother had decided to come to the battlefield himself. Then Boris said that everything was going according to plan. At that moment, the hero realized that Eshel had been behind it all along. Lord Kian lowered his blade and fell to his knees. He thought of his childhood, longing to understand the laws that governed the world around him. But his brother had always been one step ahead, and now he was up to something again. Eshel looked at Kian and calmly began to speak. You don't seem to understand why I'm here at all. Kian asked why you hired Boris. I'm ready to tear all our enemies to pieces and I don't need any help. Eshel looked away and said that Boris had already done his job. He did his mission 100% and he detained you. Kian looked at his brother with a puzzled look and wondered what it all meant. Eshel began to explain. You did an excellent job, Kian, for the sake of our family and for the sake of our people. You protected our holy land and me personally. That is why I will be grateful to you for the rest of my life. Then Eshel kicked Kian in the chest and went on to say, I have decided to get rid of the debt that has weighed on your shoulders for ten years. Kian fell onto his back with a groan, and kneeling back down, he said loudly, I never disobeyed my father's orders, and now I don't understand what I did wrong. Then Eshel looked angrily at his brother and began to answer, If you don't understand it yourself, I'll tell you so that it's clear what your problem is. When you became a despicable murderer, you lost your humanity. 
Then the hero said quietly, You decided to wipe your feet on me just because someone said something stupid about me. Hearing this, Eshel angrily started shouting, All these years we have listened to your lies. Your sins are unforgivable. Lord Kean kneeled and thought about how my own brother could call me a despicable murderer. Does he realize how much hard work I've done? The hero's eyes turned red. He looked at his brother with a beastly stare and shouted loudly, How dare you accuse me of all the sins of the world? Where were you when I was deciding the important affairs of the Empire for many years and never interfered in the squabbles over the Imperial Crown? Also did not allow situations that could lead to conflict and interfighting. Repeatedly suppressed demonic forces. When there was a war to unify the continent, I reclaimed most of the Holy Land. Day in and day out, I defended the territory and authority of the Empire. Kian saw that Eshel had turned his back and continued to say, I had a hand in the success of all your endeavors. Then the hero slammed his fist into the ground and said, You don't even want to listen to the man who dedicated his life to you in the hope of your own benefit. Kian bent his head and closed his eyes and thought, This is your payment for your loyalty. So you chose to humiliate me in front of everyone. I spent twenty years plowing you like the last dog. The hero opened his eyes, and a bright light burst out. The wave of energy that emanated from his body spread out over several dozen meters. Then Kian felt his body temperature rise sharply and blood spurted again from the recently received wound. When the hero's face had fully taken on a demonic look, he turned to Ashel, not caring about the consequences. If you want to kill me, go ahead, but we'll go to the afterlife together. Kian let out a battle cry, and the next wave of black matter made all the watching knights crouch in fear. The knight standing twenty meters away immediately began to say it was impossible even after the battle he had so much mana. Is he even human? The continent's greatest hero is shaking in fear of his younger brother, whose life he himself attempted to destroy. Meanwhile, Eshel concentrated his gaze on Kiana while saying that you were actually using demonic power. Kian rushed forward and said, I'll show you the level of my power, and immediately attacked. But Eshel was ready and put his sword in front of him and repulsed the attack. The second attack came just as sharply, but this time Eshel fended off the flying blade. Then Kian realized that he had to change tactics and retreated, preparing to make only one accurate strike. Meanwhile, Eshel saw that the enemy was much faster. Therefore, it is necessary to strike at a weak point that will interrupt the regeneration. The hero realized that with such a short blade, he needed to shorten the distance as quickly as possible. So he charged the blade with mana and began to close in on his opponent. Running up from behind, Kian began to deliver a devastating blow with full force. Eshel didn't even have time to orient himself, but a barrier suddenly appeared to protect him. At that moment, Kian realized that someone had interfered in the fight and put up a protective barrier. But still, he decided to gather his remaining strength and break through the defenses. Eshel immediately turned his attention to Boris, who was holding the protective barrier and without hesitation struck with his sword. The bright light so blinded Kian that he didn't notice the attack and the sharp sword pierced through his body as it flew away. The hero felt a sharp pain in his stomach, and losing strength dropped his blade. Then Eshel began to say, as my brother, I wanted to give you an easy death, but you showed your true colors. I've known your nature for a long time. You've killed many monsters in your short life, but you've turned into one of them before you know it. I'm very hurt that a loved one has gone over to the other side. There's a reason I didn't trust you. Then Eshel struck his brother from his leg, pulling his sword out of him. Bleeding, Kian collapsed to the ground with a thud. Meanwhile, Lord Eshel gave the order to move out. After bowing to his lord, Boris immediately went to gather the knights. The hero lay in a pool of his own blood, unable to believe it had ended so sadly. He started to think how pathetic I was. I guess I'm done living like a fool and dying like one. Kian looked with unseeing eyes at the passing world, realizing he wasn't ready to leave it yet. As he walked away, Eshel sensed the impending danger, and turning his head, he noticed some movement. Gathering the rest of his strength, Kian rushed at his brother, intending to take him with him to the other world, as he had promised earlier. 
The hero put the knife to his brother's throat and let out a wild scream, realizing that he couldn't break his promise to his father. Taking advantage of this moment, Eshel struck a devastating blow, taking his brother's life. Suddenly, a sightless darkness appeared in front of the hero's eyes. The pain stopped, and there was no fear at all. But a familiar voice seemed to be very close by, repeating young Lord Kian. The guy opened his eyes abruptly and started talking. Finally, I felt the perfect balance. I don't care what happens next anymore. The girl came closer and continued to speak. Lord Kian, wake up. You should be up long ago now. Kian still couldn't understand what was going on and asked Emily what you were doing here. He could feel drops of cold sweat running down his body. The place he was in looked very familiar. After that, the hero looked at the girl and began to say we haven't seen each other for 20 years and she doesn't have a wrinkle on her. The girl put her hands on her chest and immediately replied, Yes, what are you talking about? Lord Kian may not be awake yet. Then Kian began to look at the furniture while saying, This is my childhood room and all the furniture is still in the same place. He put his hands on his face and in a trembling voice began to say, I'm back to my childhood, or is it Lucifer himself playing a joke on me? Emily put her hands on his waist and started to say, Lord Kean, get it together, or you're just going to pretend to be sick again. But Kean gave her a look of incomprehension and said he wasn't even going to do that. Then the girl leaned over and spoke in a commanding tone, not even try to miss the duel. But the hero stopped his gaze on the girl's breasts and thought that twenty years ago he had not even noticed her beautiful body. Emily continued to speak, Lord Kian, you are definitely awake. Why do I feel like you can't hear me at all? Then Kian began to answer, I think I'm coming to my senses. Then tell me what the fight is about. Then Emily replied, Lord Kian, not to say that you had forgotten about the training match. But even so, I reminded you in time, and you still have time to get ready. The hero got out of bed and quickly got ready. Ten minutes later, he was already standing in front of Duke Vert's castle. Kian walked calmly down the street, but the memories were haunting him. There was no doubt in his mind that this was a fortress from the past. Kian then looked around to see if the demons were following him. At that moment he wondered if his life was passing before his eyes. When Kian and his maid arrived at the central square, it was already crowded. Then he thought I remember this day 27 years ago very well. Today is March 1st, 985 years since the creation. This action takes place a year before the enrollment in the academy. At the beginning of each month, the family organized a practice fight between the sons. It was an important event that the Duke attended in person. He was the ultimate judge of who would fight whom. My opponent is Cran's Worth, a half-brother the same age as me, whom I never liked. His mother is Duchess Margaret Argius. For that reason, he was given much more attention, even though we're both younger. Of the four sons, I am the only bastard with a murky origin. After that fight, I became the laughing stock of the world. I remember my father coming up to me and asking me to just stay out of the way. It was painful to see that he had lost interest in me. Emily stood nearby and whispered in Keanu's ear, It is not too late to refuse my lord. But the hero confidently replied that I would just win this fight and thought that even my personal maid did not believe in me. Kian pulled out his weapon thinking it was a simple rapier, but it felt so heavy meanwhile the maid warned my lord to be careful not to hurt yourself. The hero clenched his fingers on the hilt thinking this is definitely not a dream or a deathbed memory. And I've never heard of similar illusion magic. Everything looks real, which means I'm really back in time. I wonder if I can change the course of events. When Kian came to the center of the main square, his rival came closer and said, What a daredevil! I thought you had chickened out and wouldn't show up. But the hero ignored the provocation and looked at the head referee. He waited for the signal to start the fight. The duke raised his hand and began to speak. I hope you know the rules, so without further ado I order you to proceed to battle. Then Cransworth drew his sword from its scabbard and gaining momentum shouted loudly, Don't you dare be distracted. Krantz ran closer and raised his sword over his head to deliver the devastating blow he had been practicing for so long. Kian looked at his opponent and wondered what was wrong with him, because in a situation like this, you can't just walk around like a snail. Then Kian calculated the distance, and at the last moment took a step back, allowing him to dodge the blow. 
When Krantz realized that his heavy sword had missed him, he was very upset because it was his crowning blow. The strong strike of the blade against the stone echoed, and everyone present immediately turned their attention to the two fighting guys. Then Cransworth turned around and with clenched teeth hissed, You're going to wish you'd gotten sick like last time. And striking a second blow, he continued to say, Stop dodging coward. But the hero knocked the sword out of his opponent's hands with one swift swing of his rapier. And with one hand in his pocket, he decided to teach Krantz a lesson. So Kian didn't have time to think about it and kicked him in the leg. A hard boot struck hard just below the knee. Krantz, feeling the sharp pain, squealed loudly in a child's cry. He then fell to the ground and holding his leg began to sob loudly despite everyone looking at him. Margaret Argus was sitting next to the Duke and she was ashamed. So she started to say, Krantz, get up and fight, he's half your size. At that moment, Kian's left eye began to emit a red light. He thought the fight would be over as soon as I pointed my sword at his throat. But I'm not at all satisfied with what to do. After all, Krantz thought I was a loser and was looking for the perfect moment to mock me. He made my life a living hell for fun and repeatedly beat me with his feet and hands. But the most frustrating part is that he kept doing it at the academy. Krantz took advantage of being taller and stronger than me. He took pleasure in hurting the weaker ones. The hero's eyes turned red. He looked at Krantz with a beastly stare and calmly said, I'm going to beat the crap out of you. After saying that, Kian walked over to the lying guy and threw a punch that landed in his chest. The crane screamed so loudly that saliva came out of his mouth, but Kian ignored the tears and struck a second blow, saying, I'll take my own life this time. After that, Kian threw a punch to the stomach. The crane immediately began to burp. The next blow that landed on his face finally knocked out his opponent. The fight ended with Krantz completely defeated, and my father postponed his planned adventure to meet me. I must have made quite an impression. He sent his personal bodyguard and top knight to accompany Yurkin. As Kian walked through the castle, he saw Krantz's mother heading towards him. The hero knew she had a mean temper, but he wasn't afraid of her. When Marguerite came closer, the hero thought it looked like she was coming from the infirmary just in a rage, so he asked the Duchess how Kranz was doing. Marguerite stopped abruptly and started to say, How could you do that to your brother, cheeky little brat? The hero didn't hesitate long to reply that a duel is not a game. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go. But Marguerite went on to say afterward, This is why you shouldn't mix blood with people of lower classes. What do you expect from a scum of the earth? Be thankful you can be here. We should have left you on the street in the first place. The hero's eyes turned red. He looked at Marguerite with a beastly look and began to say, Duchess, are you really not afraid I could cut your throat? Someday your long tongue will lead you to your coffin. If you call me a freak, I got nothing to lose. Then Kian thought maybe he should just kill you. But death is too easy an outcome for you. I have a better idea, but it takes time. The hero looked at Margarita and went on to say, You know, I'm going to the academy with Krantz. Marguerite answered without thinking, and so what? Kian asked if you're not worried about your son at all. He could be missing a couple of limbs by graduation. Then the duchess hissed like a snake. Since when did the bastard decide to scare me and my son? She put her hand up while saying, Watch your filthy tongue. I should teach you some manners right now. Then Yurkin covered the boy with his hand and began to say, my lady, your behavior is unacceptable. We must hurry. We can't keep his lordship waiting. Marguerite froze with her hand raised, not daring to strike Kian. Jurgen looked at Marguerite and apologized. He had many scars on his face and a look that made people fear him. Then Marguerite lowered her hand. She realized that it was better not to argue with Jurgen. Kian, hiding behind the huge knight, showed Marguerite a gesture that meant ram for he realized that the duke's orders were absolute. Heroes thought it good that I am now under the protection of one of them. It's nice to have a knight outside the duchess's control. A few minutes later, there was a knock at the door. Duke Villiersworth said in a loud voice, Who's there? Come in. The boy came into the room and immediately introduced himself. I am Kian, the youngest son of House Worth. At your command, I have arrived, your lordship. At that moment, the hero thought it was our first dialogue in 15 years. Father doesn't like people who talk too much. 
His respect can only be earned through rank. Duke Villiersworth looked at Kian and started to say, sit down, I want to talk to you. Kian thought about the fact that the Duke is currently the ruler of various western lands of the Wusuf Empire. Many know him as the protector of the continent, a great hero gifted with magical talent and a sharp mind. He has dedicated his life to slaying monsters. He was the only one who could stop the demonic invasion. A man who took on an impossible burden. Until his death, his only wish was peace on the continent. But the amazing thing is that he managed to keep it all together over the years. However, this differs from my recollection. My father chose this sad outcome for himself. He's a fool for choosing to be a servant of the people, and that's what ultimately ruined him. Duke Villiers sat down on the couch and looking at Kian began to say, You moved as if you were calculating the trajectory of the sword. How did you know he'd attack like that? Then the hero started to respond, I'm sorry, but I didn't know how he'd act. Villiers went on to say at the moment of Krantz's lunge, You saw the trajectory of the rapier. I think you even timed it. You angled your body perfectly to avoid the sword. That's the kind of subtlety only fighters who've spent a lot of time practicing can see. I've heard rumors that you have no interest in jousting at all, but your demeanor during combat suggests otherwise. The Duke asked when you learned swordsmanship. Kian thought my interlocutor was very attentive and immediately began to answer nothing of the sort. I just practiced in the evenings. Then Villiers began to say the Khan I know has no ability or desire to learn swordsmanship. I don't see the point in hiding such talent. Kian began to explain that he didn't want to draw attention to himself. But the desire to improve his physical abilities was always present, the Duke said calmly. So the lack of information had played a cruel trick on Krantz. Then Kian held his head and lowered his gaze, for he knew where the conversation was going. Villiers looked at the guy and wondered if you thought you were a little over the top with the outcome. Kian thought, what a provocative question. He wants to probe my character. I need to show confidence. The hero said he wanted to prove himself. The Duke starts saying you're trying to prove yourself by kicking the guy in front of everyone, or are you talking about something else? Then Kian confidently began to answer that even though we are half-brothers, Krantz and I are rivals. I was only honoring the terms of the duel, and he didn't want to hurt Krantz, so he didn't use his rapiers. I think getting kicked is a better outcome for him. Villiers laughed loudly while saying, I am immensely pleased with your talent, my son. You did the right thing in that situation. Only the strongest survive in this world, so I'm sure you'll be of great service to Eschel. The boy looked at his father and thought that everything was repeating itself, and if he had to serve Eschel, nothing would change. Well, what could be done differently? Eschel is the narcissistic egomaniac who killed me. How could he use such a devious plan and finish me off wounded after such a hard fight? But you can see by the look in his father's eyes that he's still obsessed with Eschel and has high hopes for his pure blood offspring. Kian clenched his fists, thinking about how badly I'd been treated in my past life. I didn't know when the next conversation with my father would be, but I had to do something to influence the course of events. Williams cheerfully began to speak, hardly what you'd call a prize, but I want to reward you for winning. Just tell me if you want anything. Keon realized that his father's order was unquestionable, so he could not refuse to serve his brother. He figured since this was the inevitable course of history, I'll just destroy the scumbag Ashel's plans. The Duke continued to say honestly today, You surprised me, so don't be shy because you like the rest of the children have many wishes. Then Kian said he wanted to go to the front lines. Half an hour later, the lad returned to his room and told his maid all about it. Then the girl began to shout, My lord, but you were supposed to make a wish. But of all earthly goods, you chose punishment. Kian sat up on the bed and opened the top button of his shirt and began to say his father hadn't made a decision yet. Emily couldn't contain her emotions and said, Is this a joke or are you completely crazy? Do you know what horrors are happening on the front lines? The hero smiled and began to reassure the girl, saying, you know that our region of Velius is part of the western lands of the Vusif Empire, so I don't have to go far. Emily replied without thinking, but the whole battlefield is swarming with demonic beasts. 
Even experienced knights are afraid to go there. It's also the only place in the empire called the front line. Many warriors who crossed the river into the valley have gone missing. The most advanced area on the front lines is the Lemel Valley where the centuries-old war with demons still rages on. Then Kian began to explain to the girl, you see, my father was adamantly opposed to my exile. But he finally agreed on one condition. In one month, I should be competent enough to survive in the valley. But I don't know all the conditions of fitness. Kian thought he'd start by building muscle because a weak body is no good. One thing I'm glad about is that even after I came back from the other side, the feeling of combat stayed with me. But the rapier seemed so heavy, so I must learn to use the weapon again. There's also some mana in the body. If I train myself, I can put that mana to good use. All right, I'll start practicing right away. The hero, along with his maid, heard approaching footsteps. Suddenly, the wooden door swung open. The girl came into the room and immediately started talking Kian, so there you are, and I've been looking all over the castle for you. She stopped in the middle of the room and glared menacingly at the boy. It was clear from her clothes that she was a noble woman. The custom-made corset perfectly emphasized her waist and bust. Kian interrupted the silence by asking Ellis if you were ever taught to knock. Then the girl came over and grabbed Kian by the shirt. The maid wanted to lighten the mood and started to say welcome to Lady Ellis. But the girl started to shake Kian, saying, You've got your balls over your rollers. You seriously asked your father to go to the front lines. The boy replied briefly, Sis, why don't you let me go first? Then the girl let go, but Kian didn't even try to stay on his feet and fell to the floor. He made a face like he didn't care. This behavior made Ellis even angrier, and she screamed that you believed in yourself after the fight with Krantz. But I'll temper your fervor. Let's go to the roof. After that, Ellis turned her attention to the maid and began to explain that Keon would be back soon, just that I needed to do some preventative maintenance so he wouldn't get misled. When we got to the roof, Ellis informed us that the duel would begin as soon as we drew our swords. If you last three minutes, I'll let you go to the front. The hero answered reluctantly, but it's impossible without it because I'm very tired today. It's a nice walk, but it's nighttime outside. I suggest we go to bed and we'll talk about everything tomorrow. But the girl insisted on her own saying, Don't embarrass yourself. Leaders should be ready to take the fight even at night. Or do you consider yourself a subordinate? Let me ask you a question. Do you want to lead our kind? Or do you want to live your life as a loser who's afraid to take the fight to the enemy? At that moment, Kian thought that's what she was getting at. I really don't see the point of going into battle. Ellis grabbed the hilt of her sword without waiting for a response and warned him to defend himself. The hero nudged his rapier, thinking about the fact that he had already fought Krantz today. What a busy day. The girl drew her sword and began to close in. Keon realized that this was no joke, and if he retreated, he would forever remain a coward in his sister's eyes. The sharp blade slicing through the air made the hero concentrate, and he lunged to meet it without hesitation and repelled the attack with a sharp movement. The metallic sound echoed through the dark streets of the city. Ellis struggled to hold the sword while thinking it was impossible for the child to block such a strong blow. She immediately ran away to a safe distance to see how the enemy was moving and not to make a mistake with another attack. But Kian stood still and thought she didn't care about our age difference. After a few seconds, the girl could still feel the vibration from the blade to the hilt. She wondered how the kid could parry the sword with some thin rapier. He doesn't even make any unnecessary movements. It was probably an accident, and I don't think he saw the fear in my eyes. After thinking about it, Ellis smiled and spoke, and you've grown up, Kian, time flies fast. Kian looked at the girl from head to toe and started to say, You know, I've noticed that you've grown too, you've got a nice figure, and your hair is so thick and long. At that moment, the girl pulled a dart out of her hair and threw it with aim. The hero noticed something glittering in the air, and thanks to his good reaction, he fought off the flying object. But the girl was already one step ahead, and lightning fast approaching, she began to strike with her sword. At the time, she thought she had combined the perfect attack, but the opponent doesn't make unnecessary movements. Kian realized that he couldn't hold the heavy blade of the sword above him, so he took an incline 
and the blade began to move away with a squeaking sound. He knew he couldn't hold the heavy blade of the sword above him, so he took an incline and the blade began to move away with a squeaking sound. He then took a step to the side and it allowed him to throw the sword away. Then he went on the attack and the thin blade of the rapier began to close in on the girl's throat. Ellis began to back away fearfully. Kian thought her ruse hadn't worked and I was complimenting her. He decided to gather his strength and fight back. Still, Ellis managed to block the attack, but the force of the blow was so great that the girl managed to keep her balance. The hero saw a bright burst of light resulting from the collision of the two blades. He stepped back and jumped to the top of the stone wall without hesitation. Kian thought it was close, and if he hadn't twirled his sword, he might well have killed her. Most blackout techniques are designed to kill the victim instantly. With my powers, it's impossible to fight and think about not killing her. If we keep this up, someone's going to die today. How much longer until three minutes? She's a serious opponent. That's why I'm not going to take my eyes off her in case she decides to throw something at me again. I've compensated for my lack of muscle with mana in my sword, but I'm at my limit. I think she's up to something, and I wish I knew what she was up to. Alice tilted her head and whispered, Oh, earth and wind show strength and become my blade. Help me to victory. At that moment, Kian thought she was trying to scare me. Maybe Ellis really can use six-star magic. A few seconds later, energy filled the girl. She raised her water blade up, and it glowed with a bluish light. Kian was gripped by a chilling fear he thought Ellis wanted me dead. The only thing I need here is magic. Meanwhile, the girl like a parrot began to repeat, I will not lose, I will definitely not lose. The hero quietly said badly she had lost control. If I do, a blow of that magnitude will send me flying. She seems to be infusing the blade with mana. There seems to be no choice. Suddenly the girl's sword flashed with a blinding flash and for a moment erased the darkness in the entire city. Kian decided it was the perfect moment to end the fight. He swiftly headed towards the girl, thinking that he needed to interrupt the regeneration by any means necessary. Emily gave him a demonic look and began to strike. Kian thought, but where the hell are you? Please come as soon as possible. It was my first time facing such an opponent, but fear would not make me back down. Suddenly, Jerkin appeared and grabbed the hilt of his sword, deciding to interrupt Ellis's attack. Jerkin caught Kian with one hand and held his sword in the other, perfectly timing the trajectory of Ellis's attack. The water blade glinted with a bluish flash, and the impact sent sparks of purple into the air. A burst of bright energy once again dawned on the night city, and all the stored mana flew out of the cracked blade. Even the stone columns shuddered from the ringing sound, but Jerkin didn't even move. He realized that Kian was no match for her. So the knight looked at the girl unhappily and began to say, Lady Ellis, you don't seem to be in control of yourself at all. You shouldn't go overboard because your opponent is Lord Kion. First of all, you must choose an age-appropriate opponent. Meanwhile, Kian thought it was a good thing my personal bodyguard showed up on time or I was about to say goodbye to my life. In that moment, Ellis realized that the blow was so hard that the blade twisted on the ice blade. She put her sword back in its scabbard and immediately hugged her brother, saying, I'm sorry, how could I have forgotten? Tears sprang from her eyes. The girl went on to say, I was so disgusted at the thought of you leaving that I lost control of myself. Kian smiled, thinking that this was Alice's way of giving her best in everything she did. Her desire to be the best made her forget everything else. Even the academy harbors the most talented students in swordsmanship, magic, and academics. She was ranked highest. Because of her appropriate appearance, people began to call her the child of God. Some people believed she grew up with a sword in her hand. Ellis was the consummate elite in all subjects. She gave Eschel great competition for the title of the continent's next defender. However, shortly after joining the Order of Light, she met a tragic end. Her death was a shock that I've never been able to recover from. This is why I hate the Order of Light. Kian pressed hard against his older sister and rested his head on her shoulder. At that moment, the hero thought I missed Alice very much, and this time I will protect you. 
By this time Alice had stopped crying and calmed down a bit and started to say, Kian, believe me I'm truly sorry for losing control of myself. Turning her head, the girl continued to speak. Sir Yurkin, didn't you say you were your father's personal knight? He has gone on adventures. Then what are you doing here? Then Jurkin began to answer, I was carrying out his lordship's orders to protect Lord Kian, my lady. The order was secret, so I couldn't tell you before. Meanwhile, Kian reasoned I had noticed the surveillance shortly after meeting my father. It was hard to pretend I didn't see him. But why would my father secretly entrust Yurkin with my defense? I'd have to find out everything in detail. But it doesn't matter now that my sister is hugging me and my father is finally interested in me. I've never had this feeling before. Maybe I am loved after all. Emily said softly in the cold wind outside and you were wearing a thin shirt. I'm sorry I dragged you outside. After all, you're still a child and should be in a warm bed by now. The next day, Ellis returned to the academy. She stopped by to see her father before graduation. Keon decided to spend the next two weeks practicing. He did push-ups every day, but his strength ran out very quickly. After another workout, an exhausted Keon collapsed to the floor, thinking that ten push-ups was the limit and two weeks had been a disappointment. In a previous life, I had a great physique. I wish I could get it back. I need a new plan. He heard footsteps approaching and turned his head to see his maid. Emily said she'd brought a parcel from Lady Ellis. Then the guy happily started to say, thanks to him, I can solve the problem. Emily covered her nose with one hand and held a vial in her other hand. She wondered what it was and why it smelled so bad. To ease the awkwardness after the sweet duel, Kian asked Ellis for the blood of a hellhound. And now he's gotten this rare resource from the Lemel Valley. But it looks like it's also available on the black market. The guy started pouring the blood into the plate, knowing that the blood of demonic beasts has a terrible odor, and it also causes burning in the mouth. A lot of people think it's poison. However, the use of such permanently increases physical and magical powers. For most people, this is a bajillion, but in a past life, he had seen with his own eyes how a story turned into a life. Emily stepped back a few feet and, covering her nose, asked my lord if you were going to drink it. Kian replied shortly, not to worry, but I have to drink it. He began to drink the contents, thinking that I was the only person who could survive your cooking. I remember her first courses very well. Mushroom soup, after a spoonful of which I could hardly get my pulse back. Compared to this, the blood of hounds is delicious. The hero drank every last drop of blood, and putting the plate on the table began to say the smell is horrible, but I imagined it was a cocktail. The flavor doesn't really cause any disgust. Emily squeezed her eyes shut and said, I'm afraid I'm going to be sick. Keon wiped the blood off his beard and feeling a sudden surge of strength began to shout, This tastes better than some of your dishes. The maid immediately excused herself. I'm sorry, my lord, but cooking is my weakness. I'll ask the head chef to teach me how to cook, but don't drink any more of this nasty stuff. Keon said he was going for a walk because he wanted to see how well the hellhound's blood worked. The boy walked along an ancient road paved with hexagonal spreading slabs, the cracks in the slabs and the joints between them overgrown with heather and prickly thorns. The road climbed up to a dense forest, and Keon stopped to look down on his hometown. As the boy got farther away, he thought that he hadn't come here for a long time and had waited two weeks for the opportunity. It's good that Yurkin left to report to his father. I used to come here whenever I wanted to be alone. But one day, Eshel received a revelation from Lumindel, the god of light. In the revelation, he learned that somewhere in the forest wilderness of Velius, an ancient sanctuary was hidden. Even though we didn't believe in it, we somehow managed to find a place of mana concentration. Naturally, there was no insight in this life. Keon sat down and touched the ground with his palm, trying to figure out where the place was. Suddenly, red smoke began to envelop the hero's hand. He thought I was the only one who knew this place. Then Keon slammed his palm against the ground, and a flash of red flame rushed forward. He smiled, thinking that Eshel, even in his wildest fantasies, couldn't imagine what I was about to do. Instantly, a flash of red flame struck an invisible wall. 
the ground shook and began to part, forming a path downward. The loud crack of breaking rocks was drowned out by the dense forest. The boy decided he had to get down to business and strode down the stone steps, thinking that this place was a little different from what he had seen before. Even before the war between demons and gods 300 years ago, it was used as a shrine to Lomendel, the god of light. And even the war that turned the entire history of the earth to dust luckily couldn't destroy the sanctuary. Who would have thought such a place would be hidden in our forests? When Velus was swallowed by darkness, people hid here and prayed for a brighter future. Kian anxiously looked at the sword floating in the air with which the legendary ruler had slain many monsters. The light from the hilt of the sword illuminated the large room. Here he is, the lord of the sanctuary, exclaimed Kian, realizing that the sword represents the all-pervading mind and also gives the luminous power of intelligence and insight. August, 999 people managed to free Vels from demons. But losses were very big because usual people could not compare with demons. Soon demons returned and on their way killed all living beings. The battle was changed by ancient relics called the Orders of the Gods. They brought mankind a quick victory. One such relic is the Duran Dark Holy Sword blessed by Lomendel. It played a key role in the exorcism of the demonic forces. Later this sword passed into the hands of Eshel, and with this sword he killed Kian. It's a terrible memory, but now the hero is safe. The boy walked quickly up the steps, and stopping in front of the huge sword, thought that there was a possibility that Duran Dark was connected to my return. Then Kian touched the relic, hoping something would happen. He was ready for anything. But after a few seconds, the guy realized nothing was happening and started saying, I need to find out why I'm a kid again. He got angry and kicked the blade of the sword while saying holy sword and ruined the mood. I don't need you anyway. Even a rapier seems so heavy to me, and this iron is much heavier. The guy again began to climb the stairs, machine counting them. Counting the steps was 25 on this staircase ended, and the hero began to consider a strange sign depicted on the stone floor. He crouched down near the shadow and calmly said the brighter the light the thicker the shadows. He could easily be confused with the shadow of the holy sword. But it's not a shadow at all. I know better than anyone that darkness always follows the light. Then Kian slapped his palms against the rune that was embedded in the stone floor, and a flash of red flame rushed forward. The boy instantly froze and the room was illuminated by pinkish sparks. Under the pressure of the opposing forces, the way to another room opened up. He didn't hesitate to head down the path and had to kick and push hard to open the heavy door. Entering the room, Kian began to say, There you are. I'm overjoyed because it's so good to see you again. He nimbly ran up the stairs, trying to breathe silently. And when he got to the top, he immediately took the blade. Kian joyfully began to say how good it was to have my faithful partner behind the altar. The hero's eyes lit up and black matter began to be released from the blade. The boy shouted, Kiram, you seem so much bigger now. Kian held the blade in front of him while saying, Wake up, sleepyhead. I won't hide it. I missed you. Then the guy started swinging his sword, but it didn't do anything. Then he started saying, Don't keep me waiting. Get up now. As the red flames began to envelop the blade, Kian continued to say, I love this feeling. It makes me want to cut something. The ground shook under the guy's feet and black matter began to form. After a few seconds, he saw demonic eyes, two lights staring at their victim. A chilling voice echoed throughout the sanctuary. Do you have any idea what my awakening means? Kion answered briefly. I have no idea, but since I woke him up, I should use it. The black cloud continued to grow and angrily said, You fool who awakened the magic sword. Then Kion began to speak. Perhaps I should be shaking with fear and begging for mercy. I'm sorry I can't think of the right words. The demon bared his sharp teeth, saying it was too late to regret what he'd done. Your body belongs to me now. Black matter swirled in the air, suddenly spiraling in spiraling circles, and the demon began to approach the boy, baring its sharp teeth. The hero sharply put his hand out in front of him and caught the demon by the neck while saying, Make no mistake, you belong to me. You weren't so reckless before. At that moment, 
The hand on his neck clenched tighter, and the demon, taking on human form, began to say what was going on and where such power came from. I'm shapeless, how can you touch me? A red light shone in Keon's eyes, and he repeated, You're mine now. The demon preparing its claws to attack began to say that you woke me up for nothing, and you will never be able to handle me. And striking with his thin hand, the demon went on to say the child who had accidentally entered the sanctuary would die today. Keon saw the threat coming and began to dodge it. At that moment, the hero's grip loosened a little, and the demon took advantage of it and broke free. He jumped backwards, screaming at me as he did so, How dare you strangle me? The light from the open door illuminated the girl's slender body. She was furious and began to ask who you were, and I think I know your behavior. Keon smiled as he looked at the dazzlingly beautiful, yet intimidatingly formidable girl. Why are you emanating Ayers, Aura? she asked. Then Keon answered, That's right, I am Ayers' successor, and I came here for you. Magical sword, Kiram, you must bow to your new master. The girl was deep in thought. After a few seconds, she clenched her teeth and began to reply, Don't get cocky, brat. I refuse to obey. After these words, she ran up and began to strike with her sharp claws. But Kian skillfully dodged every attack. He thought it was pointless to continue the conversation. Her goal is to take over my body. Then the hero putting his blade in front of him started to retreat while saying, You leave me no choice. Let's keep it simple. The girl accelerated and put her claws out in front of her. She was ready for another attack, but suddenly she stumbled and fell. Kian started to say for the last time, Submit voluntarily before I have to force you. The girl, trying to get to her feet, screamed panic-stricken, How did you know that spell? But I've already beaten you. Then Kian quietly whispered a sword control, and the girl kneeling on her knees hit her head on the ground. Immediately after she gathered all her strength and tried to stand up. But Kian repeated the sword control time after time. As he watched the girl's head pierce the hole in the floor, he began to ask, Now you realize that my power is beyond your strength. You've bowed low enough for me to obey. The girl's legs swung around and her upper body hit the floor. She was in no condition to do anything and reluctantly replied, Okay, I'll admit you, backstabber. Then Kian took the girl's hand and helped her stand up. He looked at the open door and said that he had gotten everything he came for. The girl immediately turned into a shapeless creature and assumed her original position. Then the guy went on to say that now it was time to go back. Kiram began to reply that she'd forgotten the last time she'd seen daylight. Master, you're going to take me away from the shrine. A small cloud flew out of the blade on which appeared eyes and a sinister smile, and then continued to speak. I must have slept a long time because in my time people did not wear such clothes. Kian left the room and headed down the stairs. Kiram followed him while saying, Why do I feel so nervous? Master, what's your name? Kiram replied that it was the first time he had heard such a name and asked if Dare had really chosen you. Kiram replied that it was the first time she had heard that name and asked if Dare had really chosen you. Kian said that in a previous life, then Kiram grudgingly said in a past life, what nonsense? To which the guy replied, it's my second life. Kiram wondered who this child was. His eyes speak of the deepest memory and experience of the most ancient sages. Or maybe he just didn't wake up. That's why his eyes are like that. The guy stopped next to the sword and began to speak Master Duran Darka wouldn't show his face for at least 20 years. Then Kiram asked how she could be so sure because Lomandel is long gone and anyone can take the sword, and you probably want to take the sword, but it's heavier than you are. Suddenly, Kian struck a sharp blow, and the blade of the blade sliced off the top of Durandark's hilt. The light of the cut rune became dimmer. With his free hand, he deftly caught the top, saying, I don't need that iron. I have enough of you, Kiram. At that moment, the sword crashed to the floor. The sheer weight of the blade sliced through the stone, and Duran Dark stood in the darkness, losing his light. Karim asked in surprise what you plan to do with it. Kian looked at the rune as if it were a gemstone with a moment of eternal magical life inside it. After a moment, he began to say, I just have a good feeling about this. 
With the first glint of sunlight over the city, the main gate opened and the carriage drove out onto the sandy road. The coachman sitting in the front steered the exercise horses. Then he loosened the reins and the horses galloped away. When the coachman pulled on the reins, the carriage springs creaked loudly and a pair of horses raising dust with their hooves began to slow down. Kian realized that he had arrived and as he stepped out of the carriage, he thought that the day had come. The steel armor on his chest and back was secured with leather straps. The guy walked up to the people who were already waiting and bowed and said, Kian Worth arrived on your orders. Duke Villiers began to speak and asked one last time, You're still eager to go to the front lines because it's not too late to give up. Kian briefly replied, Yes, father, I'm already on the front lines with my heart. I've decided to work hard to earn the respect. Then the Duke looked at his knight Yurkin and ordered him to let him out. The knight put his hand on his chest and said, Yes, your lordship. Then he pulled a scroll out of his pocket and began to mutter something to himself. Kian saw the magic scroll and realized that the knight was planning to summon someone. Yurkin unrolled the scroll and took his palm over the paper with the mysterious cipher, while reading aloud from it the incantation. The enchanted parchment caught fire and created a fireball. At a distance of ten meters, a similar ball of fire appeared on the ground and a beast began to emerge from it. The beast that came out of the fireball looked at me with a merciless gaze and immediately headed for its victim. Kian thought it meant that I was going to have to fight a hellhound. He drew his rapier from its sheath and stepped out to meet the low-ranking demon from the Lemel Valley. The guy thought they really went all out for this test. The knights would surely intervene if anything went wrong. He turned his head slightly and saw the knights gripping the hilt of their swords. Then Villiers began to say a warrior must take responsibility for his words. And if you want to go to the front lines, you have to pass the test. Yurkin looked at him and began to speak, giving his father the information he needed to make a decision. His left hand clutched the scabbard in which the sword sat. But his right hand did not grasp the hilt because Jerkin hoped Kian would win the battle. The next scene takes place in Villiersworth's castle. Jerkin hears a voice saying, You want to fight me, and thinks he's talking to me. Maybe it's a joke. Then Kian stepped closer and continued to say, There are three days left until my test. I wouldn't want to fight the air the whole time. I train every day, and now I need the experience of a real fight. So you're going to help me get stronger. But Jerkin, thinking differently, started talking about whether it would be better to duel with someone your age. How about Krantz? The guy explained that for some reason Kranitz had started avoiding seeing me. And Ellis is at the academy, so there's no one to fight. Ritzar thought I was watching a guy who actually practiced, and that puts me in a quandary. But everyone who lives in these hard times must know how to fight. He removed his sword and its sheath from his leather belt, saying, Well, if you insist. However, my blade will remain in its sheath. I will focus on defense, so attack all you want. Kian thanked Yurkin and unsheathed his sword and continued to say, I have one more favor to ask of you. He looked at his opponent with glowing eyes and said, Father must not know a word about our duel. The knight looked at the boy in silence. Kian suddenly lunged forward and with a shouted order began to strike. Jerkin saw the sword glinting deadly. He got into a fighting stance and put his arm forward to ward off the blow with his legs. Afterwards he noticed that there was a deep cut on the hard cover and thought what a heavy blow. What kind of strength this kid has. Jerkin realized from the guy's first movements that he was very fast and the strength he possessed was not equal to his age. The technique of sudden combat in most cases brings victory to the attacker. At that moment, the knight looked away, but the guy had disappeared somewhere. He saw Kian doing a somersault over him and thought he had the time to do it. Kian realized that he had successfully jumped over and immediately attacked him from behind. But Yurkin realized the boy's whereabouts in time and turned sharply to repel the attack. The defense was strong, so Kian was thrown back and braked his feet on the stone slabs. And trying to find the knight's weak point, he began to close in. He jumped up again and put all his strength into his sword. But Jerkin stepped forward to meet the attack with dignity. The guy ran backwards, saying, I don't think I can handle you yet, but it's a good lesson for me. Then he put his sword back in its scabbard and went on to say, You did a good job, Jerkin. Thank you for your help. 
The knight, continuing to stand in a defensive stance, began to say, Excellent work, my lord, and thought when our frail lord Kian had managed to gain such strength. He wielded his sword in such a way that you can't help but wonder when he became such a talented swordsman. Even for me, such an experienced warrior, this boy is dangerous. After our battle, I can say with certainty that Hellhound can't handle the guy. The Hellhound emerged from the sorcerer's morass and slowly approached its victim. Kian stood in the glow of light. The sun peeked out from behind the eastern ridge and gilded the sting of his sword. He froze and stared at the hellhound in silence. The ominous beast ripped the ground with its claws and rushed forward. All the warriors in the vicinity watched what was happening. The hero raising his blade realized that the beast was attacking and jumped back before the impact itself. He figured he was still too weak for a head-on collision with the demon. We need to finish the fight as quickly as possible. The hellhound saw that the boy had escaped the attack and slowed down. The fire blazing from its backbone terrified everyone around it. Then Kian thought, I'll finish you off with one punch. And quickly approaching the demon, he struck one precise blow. The glittering sword sliced into the hellhound's neck. The hero swept over the wheezing beast and with terrible force threw a sword that nailed the beast's head to the ground with a whistling sound. Villiers whispered quietly. The fight was hot and fierce but short but he still managed to win. The blood from the deep wound in his neck was pouring onto the ground, and the fire on the hellhound's spine was beginning to die down. Kion, standing nearby, thought it was a pity the blood would have been enough for a couple of vials. Maybe carry a glass with him. He drew his sword from the beast's head, thinking it was better not to spoil public opinion. At that moment, Duke Villiers began to clap his hands while speaking magnificently. You performed admirably in the test. We gave you a formidable opponent, but you resisted with ease. Now it's time for us to withdraw. Kian put his hand on the steel armor that covered his chest and thanked his father. Suddenly, a faint smoke appeared behind the guy's back, and a voice was heard, Master, why you disappoint me so much. Eyes appeared on the little cloud, and it grudgingly began to say, Do you need me for cooking or something? Kian didn't turn his head and said, Why would you think such a thing? Then she angrily went on to say, Why didn't you take advantage of me since I need fresh blood? I could use a sip. Then she saw the body of the slain demon and flicked her tongue out to follow the scent of fresh blood. Kian looked at his subordinate's shapeless miniaturization and began to reassure her wait a little longer. Don't worry. Soon I will wash you in rivers of blood. He drew out his blade and began to speak, This legendary sword will soon kill many demons. Kiram started screaming furiously at your promises, I won't get fed up. Why did you wake me up so early? I haven't eaten anything in years, and you've decided to starve me. Suddenly, one of the knights started ringing the bell. The other shouted loudly from the northwest. The ogres were advancing. Duke Villiers immediately gave orders to get rid of them quickly. Kill every last one of them as quickly as possible. The knights immediately began to prepare to meet the ogres. The duke ordered the shackles of purification to be prepared. The warriors raised their swords and glimmers of light shot from the blades. With each passing second, the deep thunder from the demon army rumbled louder and louder. The knights spoke in an incomprehensible language, and as a result of the magic, a brightly glowing cross appeared above the ogres. The warriors looked back anxiously behind the crevice. The black figures of ogres, several dozen of them, crowded in the glow of the fire. They ran, swinging huge axes. A huge ogre with a long club in his hand approached the men. But the fetters coming out of the ground immediately bound the demon. And he tried to break free with a loud roar. At that moment, Herzog Villiers jumped on his horse and gave the order to defeat the demonic army that inspires terror in all living things. One of the knights immediately went to the bound ogre and high jumped to slit its belly. Intestines spilled out of the slit demonic belly. The second knight saw shackles coming out of the ground, binding the feet and hands of the ogres walking behind him. He ran towards me without fear, shouting first, I will cut off your feet that set foot on our holy ground and then I will cut you to pieces. As soon as the knight ran to the flat giant foot, he immediately chopped with his sword just above the bone and, turning sharply with all his might, stabbed his sword into the hard foot. A piercing howl deafened everyone and black blood spurted onto the ground. 
The ground shook with the thunder of the ogre's heavy body. Kian and his maid saw the knight slit the ogre's throat. Two streams of tears rolled down Emily's cheeks, and she began to ask my lord in a shaky voice what you could possibly need here. You're not scared because it's so creepy here. Kian sitting on his horse thought, and here I am again. I almost miss this place. Duke Villiers, who was not far away, looked at his son and began to say, This is the first time you've seen demons dozens of times taller than humans. How does it feel? Kian replied that he was a little worried. Then the duke went on to say, As you see, life here can be lost at any moment. Never let your guard down. The boy smilingly thanked his father for the tip and thought about the fact that it was just one of many days at the front. Usually there are three or four battles in a day. Each battle is conducted according to strict protocol. Meanwhile, the commander-in-chief has given the order to fire fireballs from catapults. Here, each supreme knight carries his key role, thus driving the demonic creatures away from the front line. At that moment, fireballs rained down on the battlefield. The fight lasted for at least half an hour, and all the demons were successfully exterminated. Only a few hellhounds managed to escape. Keon was assigned to the tent farthest from the front of the line. The boy put his things on the bed and looked out of the tent as he approached the exit. He looked around and thought that there were so many guards around that I wouldn't know where to get a victim for the Kirams. We'll have to wait until nightfall. Kian saw that Emily had crawled under the blanket and was shaking with fear. Then he began to say, Emily, we are in the farthest tent. Don't be afraid because all the monsters have been killed and we are safe now. Emily frowned darkly and began to answer. Didn't you hear his highness? He said that you could die here at any moment. We're on the front lines. I know there are other monsters here that are much more dangerous. Then Kian started talking in a commanding tone, saying maybe I should send you home. The girl poked her head out from under the blanket and began to shout joking with me, you're not capable of anything without me. This place is full of demon spawn. If I run off with my tail between my legs, who's going to take care of you? After these words, Emily got out from under the blanket and headed for the exit and continued to say it was time for dinner, my lord. Kian looked at her and asked for his cloak, but the girl didn't even turn her head and walked out. Then Kian thought maybe he should really send her home. Who treats their master like that? He took his cloak and left the tent with a disgruntled look on his face. After dinner, when Emily was asleep, Kian worked hard for several hours. He thought I had made a scarecrow that looked like myself, and even sewed on some extra accessories. He put the stuffed animal on the bed, and as he covered it with the blanket, he thought that the plan should work. Suddenly, Kian heard a sleepy voice even here planning to train. Then he started to reply, Sorry, I didn't mean to wake you up. Emily wiped her eyes with her hand and continued to say, You are so diligent and you never cease to amaze me. I'm sure his lordship is proud of you. Then the boy put his hood over his head and answered without thinking. You see, for my father to be proud of me, I have to earn it. I'll be back soon and you cover me up. If a guard comes by, the scarecrow under the blanket is me. You must say that I am fast asleep. The girl yawned and answered at once. Of course, my lord, I will say that you must not be disturbed in any way. Kian left the tent and thought that at night the guards were getting stronger, and he had to run now or never, because there would be no second chance. After that, he silently ran a few hundred meters and disappeared behind the high rocks. Then the guy looked around and headed for the third zone of blackness. He ran until he heard the loud growling of demons. Hiding behind the rocks, Kian realized that the hellhounds had already smelled him. At that moment, he thought of the territory called Misty Descent. It's a high-risk area teeming with monsters. A reddish light flashed coldly in the hero's eyes as he thought it was a good place to test Kiram. The guy displaying his blade in front of him immediately stepped out to meet the hellhounds. At that moment, Kiram began to say how much fresh blood the master cannot contain. Let me cut them all. Kian replied, Of course, Kiram, as you wish. The hellhounds growled menacingly and raced toward their prey. The jaws of the first demon opened wide and sharp teeth gleamed in the darkness. 
Kian saw the monster displaying sharp claws to attack and jumped aside just before they collided. The boy watched every movement of the hellhounds carefully and thought to avoid a head-on collision with them, but the fight should be over as soon as possible. The hellhound braked sharply and began to turn around. At that moment, Keon realized that the demons had surrounded him. The fire blazing from their ridges illuminated the hero more and more brightly. But he did not hesitate and, glittering with his favorite sword, began to attack while saying the misty blade of the cloudy storm. The slashed demons fell dead to the ground one by one. The glimmers of fire on their backs began to fade. Then the boy walked over to the dead beast and drove a metal tube into its neck. Blood spurted from the tube and he filled a wooden cup to the brim. He then drank the hot blood to the last drop and felt a sudden surge of strength. Kiram started talking about how it was like I was reborn. Kian started to say that in that case we should continue training. Kiram replied, but it would take us forever to build up our strength fighting mongrels. Then Kian went on to say that he could hear heavy footsteps in the darkness. Now I see flickering lights in the darkness. They're the eyes of demons and they're getting closer. Don't worry, there's still the whole night ahead. Kiram cheerfully replied, How exciting, but the monsters here are over the top. Or are you afraid of these disgusting creatures? A few seconds later, the hero saw some pretty big monsters. The night sky, shimmering with bright stars, brightened the way of the two carriages. The coachman in the front drove the horses. On the sides rode the riders guarding. As the coachman turned, trying to stay as far away from the cliff as possible, the carriage springs rumbled loudly, and several pairs of horses rushed forward, clattering their hooves against the rocky road. The two girls inside the carriage were talking. The girl said that it was too dangerous on the front lines. It's not too late to change your mind, your highness. Then the princess began to reply, I told you not to treat me like a child. How many times do I have to say it? As a princess, I must help my father, the emperor, on his journey. Don't you dare bring that up again. I think it would be better to talk about something good. The subordinate lowered her eyes down and said, Yes, your highness. Oh, yeah, I just remembered something. Duke Vert's youngest son is also on the front lines. Rumor has it he's the same age as you. The princess replied without hesitation. Duke Worth had brought his youngest son to the front lines. Maybe he's stupid enough to leave himself without offspring. But the subaltern began to reply that the duke didn't want to take his son to the front lines. His son volunteered like you, and maybe in the future you can get along with this guy. At that moment, the princess looked up at the starry sky and began to reply, I am not interested in the duke's son at all. Let's end this topic because I want to sleep. The subordinate briefly replied, Yes, your highness. Then the princess shifted her gaze to the girl and wondered what his name was. You say he's the same age as me. The subordinate briefly replied that the guy's name was Kian Worth, and he was currently at the main post near Lemel Valley. The full moon emerged from behind a cloud and illuminated the princess's pretty face. Her burgundy eyes took on a touch of mystery, and she said quietly, Kian Worth means the next action takes place on the front lines. The battle cries of the knights came from the wound, and a glittering sword shattered a demon from the valley into several pieces. The feathers of the defeated monsters flew in the air. Duke Willers, holding a bloody sword, asked if there were any casualties. A nearby knight began to reply that there were no casualties. Then the knight looked up into the sky, trying to see if there was any threat. There were many dead demons lying on the battlefield. Blood was still gushing from their wounds. Then the duke ordered everyone back. He realized that the battle lines had been disrupted and a second wave of demons might suddenly attack. Afterwards, Villiers saw his son pulling a sword out of a defeated demon. The boy knew he could die, but the determination and hardness in his eyes spoke of his desire to fight to the end until victory was won. The duke approached me and began to speak. I see that the gruesome nature of what is happening does not frighten you. It's a good thing you adapted quickly to life on the front lines. Kian bowed his head and said, I still have a lot to learn, Father. To which the Duke replied like that, and I thought you'd be gone for a long time. 
But you're doing great, son. I'm proud of you. Remember, every demon you kill brings us closer to victory. At that moment, Keanu felt very warm because he had never heard his father treated like that in his previous life. After that, Villiersworth turned around and walked away and continued to say, We have a lot to talk about. Come see me tomorrow morning. Kean thought it was the first time I'd ever seen him so kind. My father's praise is the best reward for me. The action takes place the next night. A huge demon with fiery glimmers of fire crept slowly up to a high cliff. Then he stood still for a moment and tracking his prey suddenly attacked. Kean realized in time and bounced on his side. Kean took advantage of the moment and slashed him with lightning speed. As he ran away to a safe distance, he shouted, It's a killer worm. The hero felt the ground shake from the damage and shouted loudly, Go back to your hole. I'm not backing down. Meanwhile, the giant worm with no eyes was tracking its prey by vibrations. Kieran began to speak, Mister. You seem to be having difficulties. Why don't you leave him to me? I swear I have no ill intentions. I just want to help. To which Kian replied, You want to take control. You think I don't know what you're up to. Then Kiram began to explain that the demon regenerates too quickly and that your blows can't hurt him. Kian looked menacingly at the killer worm and wondered what it had forgotten on the outskirts of the valley. Kiram is right. I'll never win at this rate. Now I have to figure out how to kill the demon as quickly as possible. It's been a month since I arrived at the front. Even though I drank the blood of many demonic beasts, it's still not enough. Then the boy whispered softly, You'll have to play along. The worm opened its serrated mouth and stuck out its tongue, which also bore sharp fangs to attack its prey. Keon looked at the approaching threat and said quietly, I guess there's no choice. Black matter enveloped the hero's hands and blade. He lunged towards it and began to slash at the worm. The magic sword shone and the blade left deep wounds time after time. At the same time, the guy shouted the ninth incarnation of the demonic sword Dense Fog. A terrible roar echoed even in the darkest corners of the valley. The giant worm stuck out its barbed tongue and wriggled in pain. The blood spurted from the deep wounds and poured out in rivers. The hero's eyes turned red, and at that moment black matter enveloped his entire body. He looked at it with a beastly gaze and made a second jump, preparing to strike the next blow. The battle system changed the guy who was not in control of himself used the mist blade technique of passing petals. The chopped worm fell to the ground, but the giant tail was ready to strike. Then Kian, fully demonic in appearance, shouted, You shouldn't have come here! And waving his blade, finished what he'd started. The fall of the giant worm made the earth shake in a radius of several kilometers. Half an hour later, the knights arrived on the scene. Jerkin, holding a torch in his hand, began to say that the amount of mana seemed impressive and that the demon had done its best. If there's a demon involved, we can't just close our eyes. Duke Villiers looked at the slain hellhounds and gave orders to burn the corpses and survey the area. Then he scrutinized the cuts that had been inflicted during the fight and thought familiar sword marks. Maybe it's just deja vu. Then Jerkin began to say, Your lordship can come over here. I think you should see this. Villiers walked over to his bodyguard. The gruesome nature of what had happened made him feel a chill run through his body. The bloody remains of the giant demon lay on the ground. Duke made a puzzled look on his face and started to say, This is a killer worm. Who could deal with such a behemoth? Could this be the same organization? We haven't found any human bodies, so it's going to be hard to determine who has that kind of power. Meanwhile, the hero thought that this technique gives Kiram control over my body, allowing her to use her true power. Embodying a demonic sword allows you to use tremendous power. However, if I let my guard down, she can take me over in a heartbeat. Kian opened his eyes abruptly as he lay in his bed, realizing that it was crazy to use Kiram to kill a single monster. Lucky I drank demon blood. If this had happened a month ago, my body wouldn't have been able to take the strain. The guy grabbed his head in terrible pain. 
A puff of smoke flew out from over his shoulder, revealing eyes and a mouth. The shapeless demon began to speak. You may look like a child, but everything about you says otherwise. I think I'm beginning to understand why you're so perfect at keeping me in check, and the spell you used after I awakened is known to few. Then Kiram went on to say, I saw you take down the Hellhounds. Your use of the darkness techniques is top-notch, completely familiar with the geography of the valley. Besides, you said this wasn't your first life. Now I'm 100% sure you're a regressor. The guy looked at Kiram's miniature and started to say, I've told you this before, but you're just getting it now. Then Kiram started yelling, and how am I supposed to understand if you didn't explain a damn thing? Now I see why you were so angry about that sword in the shrine. I doubt killing you is an easy task. Duran Dark's owner did his best, which means there are only two options. The first option is that you either fell in a duel. The second option is that you are the victim of treachery. I think the second option is correct. Kian started to answer where you got those thoughts from. Then Kiram started to answer, you were looking at the holy sword like crap. So your main goal is revenge. You can continue to stare silently and keep your thoughts in your head, but I already know. If I see you hesitate, I'll devour you immediately. Your body looks delicious. I'm just waiting for you to make a mistake. Then the guy recited a short spell and clenched his fist. The cup on the table moved. When Kian swung his fist, the cup flew up and hit Kieran flying around the room. The cup was so strong that it knocked out the miniature demon. The boy narrowed his eyes and quietly began to speak. You haven't changed at all. I was afraid of your threats in my past life, but I'm not afraid of them now because I know what I'm dealing with.